Thank you, Mick. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today. I'm also especially glad to be taking part in an occasion that is um, in part sponsored by St. Martin's School of Art, uh, where I actually did some teaching in the advanced sculpture program uh, under Anthony Caro um, back in the late 1960s, early 1970s. So when Mick Finch first approached me about giving a talk on or around the concept of the tableau at this symposium, I had to decide whether or not I felt I had something worthwhile to say. Let me acknowledge up front that I don't have much to say that's absolutely new. But the notion of the tableau has been so important to my work in several areas for so many years that it didn't seem to make sense to turn the invitation down. My first encounter with the notion came when I was working on Manet in the 1960s. But let me hold off about that. The second encounter, the one that really took, happened when I started seriously reading Denis Diderot's writings on painting and drama in the early 1970s. As everyone here knows, Diderot was the first truly important art critic, and he remains arguably the greatest there has been. His first salon, a short one, was written for his friend Melchior Grimm's Correspondence Littéraire in 1759, and was followed by others in 1761, 1763, starting to hit his stride, 1765, long and brilliant, 1767, even longer and more brilliant, 1769, tapering off, 1771, 1775, and 1781, in which he welcomed David's Belisarius receiving alms, the first of David's seminal masterpieces. Diderot died in 1784, and so never got to see a painting I like to think he would have been knocked out by, David's Oath of the Horatii, the runaway success of the Salon of 1785. When I was a graduate student at Harvard, preparing to work my way back to the middle of the 18th century, the moment where I intuited it might be possible to plant my flag precisely there and then start working forward in an attempt eventually to come to grips with, to motivate, to begin to account for Manet's paradigm-shattering canvases of the early 1860s, the old musician, Dejeuner Celebre and Olympia, for a start. I noted the dates of Diderot's salons, starting, as I have said, in 1759, and immediately became aware of something potentially interesting. That two years before that first salon, in 1757, Diderot had written a serious work of dramatic theory, his Entretien sur le Fils Naturel, Conversations on the Natural Sun, the title of a play that he had recently composed. And one year later, in 1758, he had followed up that first theoretical text with a second one, the Discours sur la Poésie Dramatique, Discourse on Dramatic Poetry. Now, I have always believed implicitly in the importance of dates, so it occurred to me to read the Entretien and the Discours first, and then go on to the Salon, also to be read in chronological order. Just maybe I thought that would prove worthwhile. Well, I did that, and the payoff was tremendous. Approaching Diderot's art criticism from the perspective of his dramatic theory proved to be the key to what I still maintain as the correct understanding of his views about painting, indeed about art generally. Because what quickly emerged was the primacy for Diderot of considerations bearing on the relationship between painting and beholder, or between what was taking place on the stage and the audience, conceived from the first as an audience of beholders. I'm referring, of course, to the reading of Diderot and other art critics, together with the French painting of the 1750s and after, put forward in my book, Absorption and Theatricality, Painting and Behold in the Age of Diderot, published more than 30 years ago. There I argue, to remind those who already know this, but also to orient those who might not, that according to Diderot, as well as to other critics of his time, but with greatest clarity in his writings, the painter was called upon to depict figures who would appear to the beholder to be truly, totally engaged, or a key term for me, absorbed, absorbé, in what they were ostensibly doing, feeling, and thinking. Only if that were the case would the beholder find himself or herself stopped and transfixed before the picture, a condition that itself emerged explicitly at this time as the sine qua non of a successful painting. By the same token, the least hint in the depiction of the figures, that one or more of them was less than wholly absorbed, that instead of seeming completely caught up in what they were doing or experiencing, 
They appeared instead to be acting or behaving with the beholder in view, so as to impress the beholder as absorbed when in fact they were not, for example, meant that both the figures and the painting as a whole would be experienced as false and inauthentic, which is to say as theatral, theatrical, the very worst of faults according to the new aesthetic. More broadly, what the rise of that aesthetic indicates is that starting shortly after the middle of the 18th century in France, and for the moment only there, the very existence of the beholder, more precisely what I have called the primordial convention that paintings are made to be beheld, emerged for the first time as a fundamental problem for the art of painting, also for the stage, but we'll get there in a minute. Only if the presence of the beholder before the canvas could be neutralized or negated or bracketed by one means or another, principally by the depiction of figures who appeared oblivious to everything but the objects of their absorption, was distinguished achievement possible. And the alternative to such achievement, work that struck the viewer as theatrical, was extremely dire. We might say that a new sort of all or nothing gulf between successful and unsuccessful art opened up around this time. I said a few moments ago that the new essentially anti-theatrical aesthetic was articulated in Diderot's writings on the stage before it surfaced in the art criticism. And it is in this connection that the concept of the tableau was first brought by him into play. Very simply, Diderot drew a basic distinction between what he called a coup de théâtre and what he described as a tableau. The first was to be avoided, the second to be sought. Quote, an unexpected incident that happens in the course of the action and that suddenly changes the situation of the characters is a coup de théâtre, we read in the Entretien. Quote, an arrangement of those characters on stage so natural and so true to life that, faithfully rendered by a painter, would please me in a canvas is a tableau, unquote. In other words, as I write in Absorption and Theatricality, a coup de théâtre took place, as it were, within the action, and marked a sudden change in the consciousness of the characters involved. Whereas the grouping of figures and stage properties that made up a tableau stood, as it were, outside the action, with the result that the characters themselves appeared unaware of its existence and hence of its effect on the audience. Put slightly differently, the tableau, as defined by Diderot, was a new technology. We could also say a new dispositif the aim of which was to enable the project of metaphorically walling off the beholder, the audience, from the action taking place on stage. As Diderot wrote, again in the Entretien, quote, in a dramatic representation, the beholder is no more to be taken into account than if he did not exist. Is there something addressed to him? The author has departed from his subject. The actor has been led away from his part. They both step down from the stage. I see them in the parterre, in the orchestra, let's say, and as long as the speech lasts, speech addressed to the audience, he means, the action is suspended for me and the stage remains empty. Or more briefly, from the discours, quote, whether you compose or act or paint, we could add, think no more of the beholder than if he did not exist. Imagine at the end of the stage, the edge of the stage, a high wall that separates you from the orchestra. Act as if the curtain never rose, unquote. The very fact that the characters in the play were to be understood as necessarily, that is structurally, unaware of the tableau they constituted served as a guarantee of that desired separation. I might add that for Diderot, the very model or paradigm of a painting that could serve as a stage tableau was Nicolas Poussin's great testament of Eudamidus. We think the early 1650s, today in Copenhagen. In fact, I think it is fair to say that the Eudamidus was the earlier painting that more than any other seemed to Diderot to be exemplary of the new anti-theatrical ideal that was gradually coming into being. The subject, Eudamidus, a citizen of Corinth, is dying. He is impoverished and dictates a will in which he leaves his mother and daughter to the care of two friends. In other words, he has perfect trust in those friendships. This is a story cited by Montaigne. Note that the painting comprises two groups. On the left, the dying Eudamidus dictating his will, the standing doctor taking his pulse, and the seated notary transcribing his dying words. On the right, Eudamidus' mother and daughter, <coughs> and note too that both groups can be characterized as seemingly absorbed in what they are doing, thinking, and feeling. 
the men in their activities, the women in their grief. Indeed, the Eudamidus' division into separate groups would have been viewed by Diderot as powerfully expressive of the obliviousness of the members of the two groups to everything but their own thoughts and feelings. He remarks more than once on how deeply moving he finds the figure of the grieving woman who sits with her back turned toward the dying man. While the consistency of the emotional tonality across that division doubtless contributed to the overall unity of effect that made the Eudamidus so exemplary for him, and not just for him. Here, by way of comparison, is Jacques-Louis David's epical Oath of the Horatii, 1784, exhibited in 85, a work that has been the focus of considerable discussion during the past quarter century. Much of that discussion has concerned the issue of pictorial unity, about which there'll be more to say. Specifically, it has been suggested that David sought in that painting to challenge prevailing conceptions of unity, if not to call into question the value of pictorial unity as such. So, for example, Norman Bryson has described what he takes to be David's, quote, assault on unity, unquote. And Thomas Crowe has argued that the very qualities of the Horatii that previous art historians had viewed as epitomizing its, quote, perfect fusion of form and content, unquote, Hugh Honors phrase, and now this is Crow again, quote, exists to sustain and validate the more immediate message of discord and provocation, unquote. In fact, the response of contemporary Salonier confirms that the Horatii was seen as challenging established ideas about how paintings ought to hold together. But I want to insist on the extent to which perhaps its most radical compositional feature, the stark division between the principal group of the older Horatius and his sons swearing their oath in, and the secondary group of the swooning, grieving women is based precisely on the separation of male and female groups in the Eudamidus. At the same time, the Horatii intensifies that sense of division by contrasting the vibrantly active men with the seemingly mostly passive women. But not, I think, in the interests of calling pictorial unity as such into question. Rather, David's project, in my view, is to use the testament of Eudamidus as the basis for a composition that would test the resilience of the absorptive ideal as a vehicle of pictorial unity under the conditions of maximum drama, one of the requirements of the age, or at least of that moment the second half of the 1780s. A larger historical point is that whereas the presence of the beholder simply wasn't an issue for Poussin, as I earlier remarked, such a presence emerged as a problem for painting only in the course of the 1750s and 60s, I take David's commitment in the Horatii to an exacerbated mode of pictorial drama and to a heightened, because simultaneously more attenuated and more schematic mode of dramatic unity to have been essentially anti-theatrical in intent. The aim of both, the drama and the unity, being precisely to seal off the painting, the tableau, from the beholder. And of course, by virtue of that sealing off, to stop and transfix the beholder as never before. This is why I earlier suggested that, David, that Diderot would have been knocked out by the Horatii. I would, it would, I think, have been his painting the one more than any other that he had been waiting for. Sadly, we'll never know. Let me turn now to a later moment, the moment of the first advent of Edouard Manet and his generation. In other words, the years around or immediately following 1860. In Manet's art of the early 1860s, I've argued in Manet's modernism and elsewhere, the Diderotian project that had got underway just over a century before had reached a stage of something like absolute crisis. Not that painters of major ambition after that date simply gave up absorption as a pictorial resource, far from it. But as the key example of Jean-Francois Millet shows, we are looking at his planting potatoes of 1861-62 in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It was no longer possible for paintings such as his to impose themselves as incontrovertibly absorptive, which is to say as absorptive in their overall effect on more than a fraction of the sophisticated viewing audience. At any rate, this seems to me to be the lesson of Millet's intensely divided status among the serious art critics of the 1850s and 60s, many of whom continued to admire him on Diderotian grounds, but others of whom, including Baudelaire, Duranty, and Gautier, found his peasant personages altogether false and mannered, 
merely pretending to sow potatoes or shovel manure or say their prayers rather than actually doing these things. Put this way, of course, it should be clear that the task of the historian or historically minded critic in the face of this divided body of writing is not to take sides, to decide whether Millet's peasants are or are not uh, authentically planting potatoes. Remember, we're dealing with depictions, not real peasants, either absorbed in what they are doing or merely pretending to be so. The important point in any case is that the absorptive strategy as such was now likely to misfire. And the chief anti-theatrical project of the great painter of the generation immediately prior to Manet's, Gustave Courbet's hyperbolic attempt to paint himself all but corporeally into his paintings, a project analyzed at length in my book, Courbet's Realism, was never a pictorial option for anyone but Courbet himself, quite apart from the fact that by the 1860s, the works in which that project found its fullest expression, the great realist canvases of the late 1840s and first half of the 1850s, belonged squarely to the past. And I'm showing you his Stone Breakers of 1849, formerly in Dresden and destroyed in World War II. There really isn't time for me to say much about it today, but I'll simply say uh, that my argument in the book is that ultimately the boy carrying stones represents, uh, is almost the continuation of uh, Courbet's left hand holding his palette. The older man on the right wielding a hammer is the right hand wielding the brush. That Courbet is all but corporeally, um, as one might say, inscribed into but merged into this painting, uh, all but corporeally, not literally, of course. Enter Manet. And what we find in the major paintings of the 1860s is precisely a decisive giving up of the Diderotian project in its various forms, and a comp compensatory, or should I say dialectically opposed strategy that I've associated with two terms drawn from the criticism of the time, facingness and strikingness. Here is his old musician of 1862, recently cleaned to breathtaking effect at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. The image on the screen gives no idea whatsoever of its present glory. That is, Manet's breakthrough pictures of the early 1860s may be said to face the beholder with a new vehemence, a new power of address, keyed not just to their mise en scène, including the fact that at least one prominent figure in each canvas directly and, as it were, challengingly faces the beholder, but also to their handling of contrasts of light and dark, their somewhat grating in the eyes of contemporaries' treatment of relations of color, and certain hard to summarize aspects of their execution. Also to their characteristic effect of abstract instantaneousness, as if each painting as a whole stamped itself out unforgettably in the very moment of beholding. In Manet's Modernism, I have an extended discussion of attempts by various art critics in the 1860s to deploy the notion of the tableau in relation to Manet's paintings. By that time, or in that context, the force of the notion was largely honorific, as it often is in the French tradition that Mick was referring to. It connoted some sort of higher unity, even as it seems to have defied more exact definition, as if the compound epithet fully achieved, as in fully achieved tableau, were implied whenever it was used without anyone critic or painter being able to explain exactly what that meant. We can say that the notion of the tableau was routinely contrasted with various other notions, those of esquisse, ébauche, and étude, for example, all of which were on the side of what we in English or American would call the sketch, and also contrasted with the notion of le morceau, the fragment or piece of the world, which mostly connoted some sort of study from life and which was associated above all with the art of Courbet, a painter of large morceaux, it was often said, but never of tableau. For Manet and his generation, Fantin Latour, Alphonse Legros, Whistler, the morceau a la Courbet was not an option. Their ambitions were other, more artistic, even as they thought of themselves as realists of a sort. But what sort of tableau, what sort of higher unity was possible with regard to paintings that tended in one way or another to eschew absorptive closure in, the fav in favor of often aggressive facingness? 
In Manet's modernism, I argue as vigorously as I know how that this was a burning problem for Manet and his co-generationists. Here, for example, is Delacroix in an essay published posthumously in 1868. The most obstinate realist, he writes, quote, is not able to make an isolated morceau or even a collection of morceaux the basis for a tableau. It's necessary to circumscribe the idea of the picture so that the beholder's mind doesn't simply founder before a necessarily cut off whole. Without that, there wouldn't be any art, unquote. And remember, Delacroix is treated as the hero of the group, Fantin, Le Gros, Whistler, and Manet, in Fantin's 1864 painting manifesto, Homage to Delacroix, a painting in which all the figures face directly outward and which was regarded by contemporary critics as largely unintelligible on that account. On the other hand, the critic Gonzague Privat, about whom one would like to know a lot more, wrote of Manet's Olympia and Christ Mocked in 1865, quote, Manet has sought the tableau without concerning himself enough with form or details, unquote. Privat italicized the word tableau, making it a technical term and not a simple noun. I remember coming across Privat's remark many years ago and feeling strongly that it was a kind of clue to Manet's endeavor in the first half of the 1860s. Even Privat's seeming criticism of Manet, the artist should have been more concerned with form and details, is softened by his praise of Olympia and Christ mocked at a moment when such praise was practically non-existent and the further suggestion that Manet needed only to make his work more comprehensible, that is, intelligible, and public success would be his. But of course, Manet almost systematically refused to do just that. Privat went further and imagined that if Manet had lived in the time of Velasquez, the latter would have encouraged him in the following words, quote, continue, monsieur, let them talk while you act. Be persuaded that certain men will understand you. Don't exaggerate your qualities. They would become defects. Strive to render nature in all its truth. All this I read is cautioning Manet against further sketchiness, to use an approximate term. Often paint the morceau, a realist practice, but be sure to preserve your artistic temperament, which demands more than that, indeed, which seeks the aesthetic qualities of the tableau. Walk with conviction on your path. If anybody ever walked with conviction on his path, it was Manet. I also cite a conservative, i.e. an absorptive critic named Théodore Pelloquet, who writes of Manet's submissions to the Salon des Refusés, crucially, the déjeuner célèbre. Quote, Manet doesn't know how to compose a tableau, or rather, he's not aware of what one understands by a tableau. I don't say that one learns that like a recipe, but finally, it's necessary to come to know it. If one knows it in a different fashion from others, all the better. That's the privilege of great painters. But when he places two or three nude figures alongside two or three others dressed in overcoats in the middle of a landscape, brushed in indifferently, I would like him to enable me to understand his intention. As you can see, the population of the Dejeuner has grown in his memory. The picture is a rebus of exaggerated dimensions that defies understanding. I could adduce other quotations. But the point is that the issue of the tableau haunts Manet criticism throughout his career without anyone, any of the critics, being able to explain exactly what a tableau was. Pelloquet admits as much with his remarks about there being no recipe for painting and about how it's fine if a painter comes to his own understanding of what that involves. The clear implication seems to be that he, Pelloquet, would recognize a tableau when and if he saw one and that the déjeuner doesn't fit the bill. In pretty much the same vein, here is Jules Antoine Castagnari on Manet in 1870, quote, I have nothing to say about this painter who for 10 years seems to have made it his task in each salon to show us that he possesses part of the qualities necessary to make tableau. I don't deny those qualities, but I'm waiting for the tableau. That is so characteristic of a vein of Manet criticism through his whole career. It's as if they see something there and Manet keeps frustrating them. There's something he refuses to give them. Um, that actually gets figured in Manet's paintings by his refusal to paint fingernails. By the end, it's as if the critics are saying, just give us fingernails and we'll give you a medal. <laughs> and Manet is saying, that's true? OK, no fingernails. My suggestion is that Manet himself was interested in the concept of the tableau. 
Certainly, he did not want his paintings to remain in the stage of a Bosch or a Schis or indeed Mia Mosso, but that the very elusiveness of the concept, its resistance to being defined exactly, even by those whose investment in it was fiercest, meant that he had no way of making even that simple point clear to his detractors, assuming for the moment that he would have wished to do so. One other text is relevant here, Stéphane Mallarmé's essay, Le Jury de Peinture pour 1874 et Monsieur Manet. Basically, Mallarmé critiques the harshness and arbitrariness of the jury on the grounds that it's the very nature of talent to be diverse, to escape the application of a single standard. The public, he says, deserves to be the judge of this, and to that end, needs to be shown, quote, everything there is, that's his emphasis, then, he says, quote, charged by the implicit vote of the painters with choosing among the framed canvases submitted those that are actually tableau, in order to bring them before us, the jurors have nothing to say beyond, should have nothing to say beyond, this is a tableau, this is not a tableau. They must not hide a single one as soon as certain of the public's tendencies latent there to find in a painter their artistic expression or their beauty, the public must be allowed to know that painter. And not introduce them to one another is not only to blunder, but to both be dis dishonest and unfair, unquote. The implication is unmistakable that whatever else might be true, Manet's paintings met that standard. But even the tiny cluster of quotations that I've just read out suggests that deciding in 1874 or 1863 or 1865 what was and was not a tableau was far from easy. In fact, it simply wasn't feasible. The concept itself, crucial as it was felt to be, being much too elusive to pin down. I don't know whether considerations such as these, the tableau as an anti-theatrical technology in the age of Diderot, and as a crucial but terminally elusive pictorial ideal in the age of Manet, precisely the moment when the Diderotian crisis project reached the stage of absolute crisis, will be of interest to this audience this morning. I value those moments, however, because they can serve to warn against operationalizing a contemporary notion of the tableau too simply and unproblematically as if the meaning of such a notion were inherently fixed and transparent, as if it simply meant painting-like or something of the sort, as if it belonged to something that might be called formalism. Now, this is not the case, to my mind, in Jean-Francois Chevrier's use of the term in his famous, his deservedly famous 1989 essay on the tableau form, which invaluably drew attention to the fact that starting in the late 1970s, ambitious art photographers such as Jeff Wall, Jean-Marc Bustamont, Thomas Ruff, and others began making paintings which were consistently larger than ever before, or that were as large as the technology permitted. Let me say parenthetically that at that moment, Ruff's portraits were not yet large, but they belonged to that moment anyway, and they're going to get large as soon as he can do it. And which also, consistently larger than ever before, and which also, this was crucial, and it's stressed by Chevrier, were made to be hung on the wall which is to say that from the outset, these photos had in view a different destination for themselves than had been the case for photography until that time. This is a large topic, of course, one pursued at length in my recent book, Why Photography Matters as Art as Never Before, where I draw one further implication from Chevrier's observations, namely, that by virtue of being made for the wall, the new art photography automatically, as it were, and from the very first, found itself compelled to engage, whether it wanted to or not, with the issue of its relation to the beholder. Put another way, the new art photography dis discovered that it had inherited the same basic set of fundamental problems centered on the relationship between work and beholder that had, if I am right, been central first to the evolution of modern painting between the mid and late 18th century, the moment of Chardin, Diderot, Greuze, David, and so on, and the advent of Manet in his generation and modernism generally. And second, to the conflict between high modernism and minimalism literalism in the mid 1960s and after, as analyzed in my notorious essay, Art and Objecthood, and related texts. This is why, in my view, 
photography since the late 1970s matters as art as never before. That is, my claim is not at all that Wall, Bustamante, and Ruff, or Thomas Struth, Andreas Gursky, Hiroshi Sujimoto, Thomas Damon, Candida Herfer, or indeed Bant and Hilla Becker are better artists than the outstanding photographers of earlier generations. Say Nadar, Sullivan, Frith, Ache, Sander, Evans, Brandt, Winogrand, and so on. I do claim, however, that for the first time ever, the issues being grappled with in the work of the most significant contemporary photographers are more than strictly photographic in their range and implication. The role of intentionality in the work of Thomas Damond, or differently inflected, in recent technology photographs by Thomas Struth is a particularly vivid case in point. Or consider a recent near documentary photograph by Jeff Wall with the lengthy title, Vancouver, 7th December, 2009. Ivern Sayers, costume historian, lectures at the University Women's Club. Virginia Newton Moss wears a British ensemble circa 1910 from Sayers' collection of 2009. Just try coming to terms with this fascinating work without engaging with questions as to Sayers and indeed Virginia Newton Moss's respective relations to the audience, presumably gathered to hear his talk. We see members of that audience reflected in the doors behind them. And by way of those considerations, the further question of the photograph's relation to the viewer. It can't be done. You have to engage with those questions. And just this fall, I published a book entitled Four Honest Outlaws, Sala Ray Marioni Gordon. That's the video artist Henri Sala, who has a show right now at the Serpentine, the sculptor Charles Ray, the painter Joseph Marioni, and however we might choose to characterize Douglas Gordon, in which I try to show that the same or closely related issues are dialectically in play in the work of those artists as well. Let me put all this even more strongly. The artistic regime or epistem that began in the mid 1750s in France and received its initial theorization in the scintillating and profound writings of the great Diderot is still in force. And to bring this talk back to the topic of our symposium, the continued relevance of the concept of the tableau is one indication that this is so. Thank you.